so <clears throat> I, uh, I came real close this morning to playing a really dirty trick on, on uh, Ransom, uh, our pastoral intern, because uh, I really feel bad. I mean, bad, bad. And so I was like this close from saying, Ransom, I know it's 9 o'clock, buddy, but you're preaching this morning. So but I said, no, I wouldn't do that to him. <laughs> so you're going to have to forgive me for being raspy and drinking a lot of water uh, as we're here this morning. You know, I'm, I'm at a new stage of life, and it's enjoyable. Uh, I have a teenager and, um, who is learning how to drive. And, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that my name now belongs in Hebrews 11 with the great people of faith. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> It's been, an, it's been an interesting experience, and uh, uh, yesterday I took him out on the interstate for the first time, and, uh, and he did great. He did really good. Uh, he's, he's really doing a good job uh, with his driving, kind of, sort of, most of the time. And, uh, but I noticed after I dropped him off yesterday, and, and he went in to play uh, cards and whatnot, and I went on about my way. I guess this was Friday, and uh, I, I was reflecting on the, the, um, the uh, um, 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 whatever you want to call it, from our house to there, uh, the adventure, and I was thinking about how I had been coaching him, you know, in his driving and whatnot, and I realized, you know, you can tell by what I stress in the car what I think is important, right? And as I was thinking about it, I started counting how many times I told him to turn on the blinker, right? He is tired of hearing it now, okay? Um, I am a fiend about the blinker. I, I realize I maybe have a blinker obsession. I'm not certain, but you know, I, I, it, it's, it's just a pet peeve, okay? I mean, you got a stinking blinker. Use it, people, okay? All right, and so, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, all right. So that gets more response than anything else I'll say the rest of the day, right? So, uh, and so, you know, I could tell, turn on your blinker, Jake, turn on your blinker, you know, because, and I understand, he's got all these things coming at him, he's a new driver, you know, he's checking both ways and checking again and all that, making sure he actually stops at the stop sign, which is real progress. I mean, all this type of stuff, right? Turning on the blinker is the last thing on that list of priorities, and I understand that, and I get that. Uh, But you could tell what I think is important, right, by what I'm stressing in his driving. Well, you know, we can tell what God thinks is important, by what he says in his word. And he obviously, our Lord, is concerned with legalism in his church because he gives an entire book of the New Testament that emphasizes and addresses the subject of legalism. You can tell from that alone that God is concerned with legalism. Now, we use terms like legalism, and sometimes we don't define them. So let me define it for you. R.C. Sproul gives a, a good example of the most traditional and a solid understanding at a very fundamental level of what legalism is. It's the fundamental distortion. The fundamental distortion of legalism is the belief that one can earn one's way into the kingdom of heaven. This is legalism from a salvation perspective. Um, But legalism is bigger than just salvation. It also touches on Christians who have already received Christ and their sanctification. In fact, in this book, in Galatians now, starting in chapter 3 to the rest of the book, Paul is really unpacking sanctification, which we, we broached last week in the message on the gospel and sanctification. And so if you ask me what is legalism, I'm going to give you something like that definition at the bottom of the screen. The belief that one's status before God is contingent upon obedience to prescribed rules and regulations. So if you are not a follower of Christ, you believe that the way you have a relationship and become a Christian is to obey certain rules and regulations. And if you are a Christian, you believe that in order to be loved, accepted, to be empowered by God, to be blessed by God, to not be punished or chastised by God, we have to obey certain prescribed rules and regulations. Um, God is concerned with legalism, gives us a whole book. Paul is clearly concerned with legalism because the language that he uses beginning in chapter three, you know, if I've already used it in my sermon, some of you would write me, uh, you know, a note or two, okay? I mean, what does he do? Several times he calls them fools, okay? Not, you know, guys, you're just, uh, your opinion isn't quite on target here. 
Or, you know, fellas, would you rethink this for just a No, he just, you're fools. You are fools. You're foolish. Who has bewitched you? He says, you're, you're fools. Three times, I believe, in the first five verses, he calls them fools. Um, very strong language, but that's because legalism is foolish. Why? Well, well, whenever you equate, whenever a person equates external, outward, moral behavior with gospel-centered Christianity, that's foolish. It's foolish. Why? Because you can, be, you can be put together on the outside. You can obey all the rules or most of the rules and the regulations. You can look good on the outside, but the inside be corrupt. Your motives be wrong. The, the purposes behind what you're doing is skewed and it's polluted by sin. This is what happens with legalism. Uh, we, we, we check all the boxes and we do all the right stuff, but the motives behind why we do those things are messed up. They're not grounded in the gospel. That's legalism. A legalist will obey the law, but ignore the spirit of the law. So the Pharisees, they look put together on the outside. Externally, they were very moral, yet they had no concept of the gospel. Uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 writes this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside may also be clean. This is a legalist and it's foolish to think that just by outward external conduct, you can say that's a good Christian, that's a follower of Christ. That's foolish. Legalism is foolish. It's foolish for the person who needs to enter into a relationship with God to choose to approach him on the grounds of legalism. For the person here, if you're here this morning and you're here because you want to become a member of God's family and your life has been going through whatever turmoil and trials and tribulations and you've come to church this morning because maybe God is the answer and he is your answer if you're here for that reason. That is, he is the answer for what you're facing. But you don't get that answer and you don't get that relationship with God by simply following a bunch of rules and regulations. Paul says in verse 10, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. In other words, if we choose to come to God for salvation by being a good person, believing that we'll work our way into the good graces of God and get eternal life through our actions or what we do or do not do, we're fools. We're fools. Because we have placed ourselves at that moment in time under the curse of the law. In other words, the only way you can relate to God through performance and be accepted by God through performance is to be absolutely perfect. It's an impossible standard. You can't be perfect. You may, on the outside, be a really good person, but if you're here this morning and that's what you're relying upon, to have a relationship with God, to spend eternity with Christ, you're a fool. Paul says, you're a fool. The Christian who's pursuing sanctification and is going down the path of legalism, Paul says, you're a fool. You're a fool. Why? Why is legalism so dangerous to our sanctification? Well, in verse 2, he tells us one reason. It marginalizes the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you only this. This is, this is Paul being sarcastic, right? Do you ever have your mom, you know, you did something and your mom wants to point out the stupidity of what you just did, right? And, and rather than just come at you, they'll, they'll say something. Now, now, let me ask you something. 
You know when they do that, right? And they do it probably with a finger. Let me ask you something. You know, uh uh-oh, bump, 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 right? Okay. Or your dad, my dad would say, "Um, uh, Jerry, riddle me this. And whenever he said, riddle me this, I knew, okay, I've I've messed up. Uh, This is Paul. He's saying, Galatians, riddle me this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? You see, they had received eternal life through the Spirit, and now they were marginalizing the Holy Spirit. They were compartmentalizing the gospel of grace and trading it in for works. Yes, we get saved by grace, but then if I want to grow in my Christian life, I have to supplement grace with my works and with my self-effort and with my performance. And Paul is saying whenever we supplement grace and the gospel with our performance, we actually supplant grace and erase it. It's foolish. The fruit of legalism alone is enough to make us understand that it's foolish to think that we will become like Christ through legalism. Why? Because the fruit of legalism is somebody whose relationship with God has the nature of a transactional relationship. You see, the legalist believes in his heart. I perform, I do my good thing, and I get from God. I do A, B, and C, God gives me D, E, and F. It's a transactional relationship with God. I do, I get from him. And then it morphs into an entitlement uh, attitude, an attitude of entitlement. In other words, I did it, now God owes it to me. See, one of the issues with the prosperity gospel, and there's many issues with the prosperity gospel, is at its heart, it's legalistic. I give X amount, God now owes me this. Steve Camp, the the Christian singer, someone shared a story with me uh, this week that Steve Camp was once on a, a program like in the, uh, you know, like, like the TBN station or one of those types of stations. And he was there right before a, a one of these uh, televangelists. And the guy came up to him and said, hey, uh, you know, uh, Steve, I'm telling you right now, if you give my ministry $100, God is going to give you $1,000. And Steve Camp says, you don't believe that. Oh, I do. If, God, if you give $100, God's going to give you $1,000. And Steve Camp kept saying, you know, you don't believe that. You don't really believe that. And finally, God says, why do you say I don't believe that? He says, if you believe that, you'd give yourself $100. In fact, you'd give $1,000. You know, but, but you see, that's the entitlement mentality. And it comes out of this transactional, legalistic understanding of God. And as we go down this path, you'll see the fruit of, of a spiritual posture that's arrogant and pride. I'm better than you because you don't do what I do. You you don't have the wisdom, the smarts, whatever, to believe what I believe. And so the legalist over time adopts a posture of arrogance and pride and soon judgmentalism and condemnation of others who don't agree with him. You're in the position that you're in because you don't do what I do. You could be me, but you're too foolish to do what I do and to believe what I believe. And so that leads to this arrogant, condemning, judgmental, critical spirit that is so associated with legalism. Ultimately, legalism, the fruit of legalism, is a magnification of self over Jesus and the work that he's done for us on the cross. The legalist treats Jesus like he's a stage and the cross like it's a stage in our spiritual development. You remember the diagram, perhaps, if you were here last week, of of the cross and how you're lost before the cross. And then after the cross, there's this idea of sanctification and a popular understanding of sanctification. And if you carry that out, you get further and further away from the cross. The cross, the gospel, Jesus, is just a stage in my spiritual development. Now I've got Jesus I've got to move on. I've got the gospel. I've got to move on to deeper things so that I can become a mature believer. So Jesus is a stage. The gospel is a stage. And the cross is a stage, a phase in our spiritual development rather than being the destination. That's a legalist. That's a legalist. At its core, a legalist, uh, maybe to use a sports analogy, 
a legalist is trusting Jesus to get him into the game, to get him onto the court. And then he relies upon himself to score and win the game. At best, the legalist relies upon Jesus to get him in the game, and then he looks at the game itself as, okay, Jesus, every now and then I'm going to need your help. Bail me out when I'm starting to fail. So it's Jesus plus my effort and my abilities that help me win the game. At worst, it's Jesus, you get me in the game, and now I've got it from here. Thank you. I'll take over. Every now and then there's a nod and a wink to acknowledge Jesus, but that's about it. This is the fruit of legalism. J.I. Packer writes this, any plus that requires us to take action in order to add to what Christ has given us is a reversion to legalism and in truth an insult to Christ. So far then from enriching our relationship with God as it seeks to do, legalism in all its forms does the opposite. It puts that relationship in jeopardy. And by stopping us from focusing on Christ, it starves our souls while feeding our pride. Did you catch that? It starves our souls while feeding our pride. Legalistic religion in all its forms should be avoided like the plague. So whether you're an unbeliever or a believer this morning, if you are going down the route, the path of self-effort, Relying and thinking that in some way, your behavior, your external actions, your spiritual works affects your relationship, your standing before God. That your standing before God is contingent upon how good you do, how much money you put in the offering plate, how much you sing, or whatever. If that is your mindset, you have put yourself under the curse of legalism. And you're deceived. And Paul would say, that's foolish. It's foolish. So much better is the example of Abraham. This is smart of Paul. In verse 6, he, he shifts attention to Abraham because remember, the Galatians were being influenced by the Jewish Judaizers. And of course, who is the father of the Jews? Abraham. There's no one more venerated. I mean, it's Abraham and Moses. I mean, Abraham, the father of the Jews. And so, Paul goes to Abraham and his life to show these Galatian Christians, and he shows us that there is a much better way than legalism. It's much wiser to go the route of faith. The blessings of God come through faith. Verse 6 says, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. In verse 6, that word counted, it's kind of a, an obscure word. It's not one that we use normally in the way that Paul is using it. Maybe a better equivalent from an English perspective would be the word credited. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. As righteousness. In other words, God conferred on Abraham a status that was not previously there. Through faith, God conferred upon him the status of one who is righteous. Now, for many years, in fact, I was even taught this in my seminary, that Abraham's faith was, in essence, a form of righteousness. Uh, Abraham believed, and that provoked or merited from God the declaration, you're righteous, to use our words, you're, you're now a, a believer a Christian. You're in the family of God. So, so his faith was a, a spiritual work that earned a declaration from God. God wanted to declare Abraham righteous. Abraham brought to the table his faith, and by then believing, God rewarded him by declaring him righteous. No, that's, that's not what happened. See, the Bible teaches us that even the faith that Abraham exhibited was not something that was in him inherently. That too was a gift that God gave. 
Abraham is still a sinner. It's not that Abraham's faith is a form of righteousness that pleases God. It's not that his faith was an act of obedience that merited and earned the declaration of God. It's God crediting Abraham with righteousness that he did not inherently have. In, in actuality, God decides to declare him righteous and to put upon him his eternal, infinite, absolute love, even though Abraham would continue at times to live sinfully in an unrighteous way. Because after this declaration, you will see Abraham at times blowing it big time. I mean, big time. I mean, he lies to the Pharaoh. He lies to the king. He's a schemer. God had promised him that he would have a child. And he believes God. is credited for righteousness. And God declares him righteous. But over time, as children didn't come along, guess what? He began to doubt. His wife begins to doubt. And so his wife one day says, you know, Abraham... If we're going to have children, you know, I am way too old, and you're getting too old. You need to come over here to my handmaiden and go on, have a relationship with her, have a son with her. That's how we'll have our son. And so God, so Abraham, rather than believing at that point in time what God had said that Sarah was going to give him a son, he goes in, he has a sexual relationship with Hagar, has a son by the name of Ishmael. You want to know where our problems in the Middle East come from? That's it. Okay? Trace it back. So so don't think that when Abraham was declared righteous, it was because he was so perfect. No, this was a legal declaration by God because Abraham trusted in God's promise and provision. Martin Luther would, would would develop a phrase called simul justice epicator, which means, from, and he takes it from this passage, simultaneously righteous and a sinner. Abraham doesn't come to God after he's cleaned his act up. And then God rewards him with a declaration of righteousness. He came just as he was, a sinner, needing redemption, trusting in God's promise, and trusting in God's provision, and not even doing it perfectly well all the time. <laughs> and God, through that faith, declares him righteous. And that's, that's such a great message for us this morning. Some of us, as I mentioned earlier, you're here, you're looking for something, you're wanting to think, can God help me? Yes, he can help you, just as he helped Abraham through Jesus Christ. You don't clean yourself up first. You don't fix all the bad parts of your life. You don't kick your habits. You don't fix your marriage. You don't don't try to become a nicer person, and then God will give me and help me and take care of what's going on in my... No, you come to God just as you are. Because the gospel, the good news, is that God can save you and declare you righteous even as you're still struggling with the temptations of the sinful flesh. Simultaneously just and a sinner. Simultaneously righteous and a sinner. It's through trusting, folks, in the same promises that Abraham trusted in that we experience the blessings just so much better than the curses of legalism to accept and experience the blessings of faith. Abraham was not rewarded because he had great faith. Now, I think in time he became a great man of faith. He's declared righteous because he simply trusted in God's promise and God's provision. It was the target of Abraham's faith. It's not the amount of your faith. It's not the purity of your faith. As the the disciples would say, Lord, we believe. Help us with our unbelief. It's not the purity of our faith. It's where you're placing your faith. Who are you trusting in? If you're trusting in yourself, you're under the curse of legalism. But when you trust in Jesus and you place your trust and your faith in him, you now have the blessings of the gospel being experienced in your life. 
It's the person that you're trusting in that makes all the difference. It's not the purity of your trust or the amount of your trust or the intellect of your trust or any of that. It's who are you putting it in. Paul tells us in verse 10 through 14 how important it is for us to trust in Jesus. He writes in verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. That little word by in these verses is it's very, very important. Paul is, Paul is telling us something profound. How we live our lives, what we live for, reveals what we're living by. You see, you have a couple of choices in these verses. You can live by the works of the flesh, self-effort, performance, legalism. That's one way you can live. You can live by performance or you can live by faith. And so what we do and how we live and what we live for reveals what we're living by. But it doesn't stop there. Because what we're living by declares who we worship. Let me repeat all that. So you can kind of, there's a lot of prepositions in there, I know. <laughs> They're just important, okay? Uh, what you live for, how you live your life and what you live for reveals what you are living by. And what you live by reveals who you worship. L let me explain that a little bit. This week, we, uh, Thursday night, Catherine's out of town, been out of town for a little more than a week now. And so, you know, when the cat's away, the mice play. Only two of you got that. Cat, Catherine, cat, Catherine. Okay, anyway. If she was here, she'd find that hilarious because she loves puns, but anyway. So that's my nod to her. Uh, so Thursday night, I, uh, I uh, go over to the beach side uh, and meet with some of the guys from over there. And uh, we go to the city tropics and we enjoy, um, you know, some, uh, some food and, and spirits and really, really good cigars. And that's, you know, she's out of town so I can actually enjoy one. And, uh, <laughs> um, and by the way, if you're appalled that I smoked a cigar, you might be a legalist. Oh, uh, no. Anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, so... Um, come talk to me later. Uh, uh, I noticed as the evening went on and the cigars were getting better and better that our conversation got more and more profound as the evening went on, you know? And, and we began to talk. And one of the guys there was a pastor from Pennsylvania. Great guy. I'd never met him before. He's friends with David Beckwith. And, and David's one of our elders. And his name was Don Logan. And he has a wonderful story. And he pastors a church up in Pennsylvania. And as the evening went on, we're meeting, talking with these guys. A lot of these guys around the table have gone through some major things in their lives. Or they're new Christians. And we're just enjoying Christ together. And we're talking about the gospel Don gave an illustration that I looked at when he got done. I said, you know what, I'm going to use that, man. I said, that's good. And so here we are. So I'm giving him credit. Uh, he was in the service last night. And he says, okay, you got it right. So you can tell people that I'm the one who did it. Um, you know, as Presbyterians, what we say, what's the chief end of man? What's the chief purpose of man? To what? It's that, right, that's right. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why we're here. It's our purpose. In other words, why are we here on earth to worship God, to worship him, enjoy him, to worship our creator, right? And so Don says, imagine, you know, you've been given your life and, you know, you're going to live 70, 80, 90, 50, however many years. And imagine all that time of worship is divided up into chips, like, you know, roulette table type of chips, you know? And if you've ever 
seen roulette, maybe you've either been there and done it yourself, or you've seen it James Bond, who always seems to win. He always picks the right number, the right color, right? You know, you get these chips, and you put them on a number and a color, and, and, you, and you might put some over here on one red and seven black and 14 green, and, you know, or whatever, and you put all of your chips around, and you distribute them, and they, they do the wheel, and then maybe you win, but most of the time you lose, because it's a foolish game. And so many of us Here's what we do. We take our chips of worship, and we put a certain amount of our chips of worship, and we put it on our career, because we find significance in our jobs. Or we take a lot of our chips of worship, and we'll put them on our children, and we'll come to a place in our lives where we're worshiping our children, and we find our satisfaction, our joy, our significance in life, and how well do our children do? Or we'll put a certain amount of our chips on money, or on prestige, or on toys, or on uh, enjoyment, on recreation, on, you know, escape from pain and inconvenience. We distribute all of our chips around. Some people foolishly put all of their chips on one thing. They put it on money, for example. And then the, cra- the stock market crashes, and what do they do? They kill themselves. Why? Because everything that they were worshiping and they were, they were putting their stock into for significance and security and happiness and joy, it all fell down at one point in time. They're left destitute. They can't handle it. And they kill themselves. Some people put it into a marriage and they, they worship their spouse and then that spouse disappoints them and does something and boom, it all comes crashing down. But most people... Distribute their chips of worship around. We put them all around and we we look to those things to fill voids in our lives. These, These idols that, and this idolatry is what it is, that investment of ourselves and those things, that is living by self effort. Turning to these different things for our significance, these idols, and that's what they are. That is simply at the core of those actions, we are living by the curse of the law, self-effort, performance. I have to do this and do that and invest here and and, and put my life into this and into this group of people and into these people in the church. I have to do all of these things so that I can have what I'm looking for. That is by living by self-effort. And it reveals, when I do that, it reveals that at the heart of the issue is that I am worshiping myself. Myself. I'm doing all of this stuff for me so that I will feel secure, comfortable, secure, significant, happy, peace. See, the way we live, what we live by, reveals who we worship. Paul is telling us, listen, Abraham, he put his chips in Christ. Abraham trusted in the promises of God and the provision that he has in Jesus Christ. If if we invest ourselves through faith and we put our worship into Christ, we are now somebody. We have significance because we are in him. We have security because we belong to Christ. We have eternal purpose because Jesus lives in us. How much more beautiful can a person become than the life of Christ shining out of their countenance? That's true beauty. True joy doesn't come through the things of this world. It comes through the life of Christ pouring himself out through us. What are you living by? Self-effort? Faith in Christ. Which one? If you're here and you don't know Christ, when you put your chips under the curse of legalism, you have brought on to yourself an impossible standard and you will fail. It's foolish. 
If you're a believer, for the Christian, if you revert back, you believed in Christ to become a believer, but now you're reverting back and living by works of the flesh, you're going to see in your life an ever-deepening cycle of anxiety, frustration, failure, discouragement, depression, and ultimately, the growth of pride and hypocrisy. So much better, so much better for us to realize we don't have to live like this. We don't have to be on the merry-go-round of legalism. If you want a relationship with God, God will come to you. He will have a relationship with you. But you have to get off the merry-go-round of self-effort. If you want to become a part of God's family this morning, it starts with you just saying, I'm a sinner. I can never be good enough. Only through Christ do I have any hope. I believe in Christ. I commit to Christ. What does Paul say? Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. See, Jesus, he earned our penalty. He took on our penalty. He accepted our penalty. We earned the curse of the law. And Jesus, he accepted that curse that we earned so that we might experience and enjoy the righteousness that he earned perfect life. Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. He took on himself the curse. Even though he didn't earn the curse, you earned it, I earned it. He took on himself our curse so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Legally speaking, what happened is this. Jesus became sin for us so that God could declare us righteous. <laughs> and our standing before God is not contingent upon how righteous we live or how good we do. Our standing before God is contingent upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And God in his favor and his grace and his mercy has poured it out upon us. And we have all the righteousness we will ever need so that like Abraham, we are eternally loved and blessed. That's the good news. We don't have to live under the curse of legalism. May God give us the humility to believe this truth. If, if someone who, by all accounts, as great a man as Abraham, needed righteousness imputed and credited to him, how much more do we need that? May God give us the humility to simply receive what God is offering to us the wisdom, may he give us the wisdom to get off the merry-go-round. Self-effort, performance, obligation, duty, and serve him out of love, gratitude, joy. Father, make us those type of people. The one who's here who doesn't know Christ, who's trying to earn their way into your good graces, by being good, and there's a lot of really good people in this church. But help them to realize that being externally good, that's foolish if they're relying upon that. For their relationship with you, it's foolish. Father, help them to trust in Christ. Help those of us who profess to follow Christ to, to continue to trust in him. To not allow us to fall victims of a trap of legalism and to find ourselves just ensnared in that performance mentality. May we, may we serve you and love you and worship you and live for you because Christ is living through us and our lives are completely just surrendered to him, enjoying his presence. Help us, Father, 
to relate to you the way you relate to us. Help us to see that love that you have and how greatly you love us. So that even though we're sinners, we're, you've declared us righteous. That just boggles my mind. How can I be a sinner and righteous at the same time? I, I, I can't make sense of that, but you're the one who judges and you're the one who declares. So help us to accept it, to receive that beautiful declaration from you that comes out of your love for us. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen.